New Mexico grass tells the story of cannabis in the land of enchantment. From the Llano Estacado to Shiprock, and from the Sangre to Cristos, down the Rio Grande and past Mesilla, the story of New Mexico is alive with culture and wisdom, and cannabis has long been a part of that tale. Please join us as we sit down with our friends and neighbors across this great state, and let's learn what they have to say. Thanks everyone for joining us. This is Brian Rogers here at New Mexico Grass. We're really happy today to have Ben Lewinger from the New Mexico Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. Ben, please tell us a little bit about the New Mexico Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. It's a super interesting organization. Sure, so the, the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce is an industry association uh, helping to bring cannabis from raft to shore um, in New Mexico. Um, and you know the industry isn't brand new here. Uh, the medical program has been around for 10 years. Uh, this iteration of the Cannabis Chamber has been around for two and a half years, and I've been involved for the last uh, year and a half. And this is, I, I believe, the third iteration of some kind of association that was aiming to bring together people in the industry. There was something else called the Guild previously, and there was something before that. Um, and I, I think the fate of the previous iterations of this really speaks to the need for exactly what we're trying to do. And that's just creating space, creating momentum, um, creating a, a place where people in the industry, people want to get in the industry can come together and support each other. Right. Who are your members? Uh, our members are um, the majority of the LNPPs, so the licensed nonprofit producers in the medical program, um, the majority of the independent manufacturers, and a growing number of cannabis adjacent businesses. So CPA and law firms. Um, we have a, a statewide health insurer who's a, a member. Um, uh, packaging companies, you know, really anybody who is understanding and excited about this new industry and wanting to to get involved that's fantastic so let's just to kind of build on something you just said if the industry if we take the leap of faith that the industry gets started soon a small mom and pop grower that that was trying to figure out their their way in the landscape here they might reach out to your organization and be able to meet a lot of different important you mentioned cpas attorneys insurance. I mean, these are, these are critical items that we don't talk a lot about, but without it, you don't move forward. These are, these would be the perfect place to go. You, your organization can be the perfect place to go to get some more information on that, right? Yeah. And I, I think after we get through uh, the legalization discussion, which God willing will be over in a couple of weeks, I, I really do think that it will be. Um, I think the, the chamber's role in this new fun industry is exactly as you described. I, I think that we've been involved um, just helping to, to make sure that from an industry perspective and from industry experience that we are uh, looking at other states, but also looking at the success and failures of our own medical cannabis program in striking the right tone um, as we move forward with, with recreational. But truthfully, I think where the industry is really gonna become implemental is exactly how you described. Once the uh, adult use industry is up and running, um, how can we support small businesses? How can we, um, how can we create these little networks of influence that will help all boats rise and, and really help the industry to quickly mature in our state? That, that's excellent. I really like that. Now, let's go back a second. You, you mentioned earlier that the, the medical industry here in New Mexico is not brand new. It's been around about 10 years. Why has it taken, in your opinion, why has it taken so long to, I mean, and we still don't have legal cannabis yet, but maybe we're on the verge of it, but why is it, what's the 10 year gap? Why is it taking so long to get over the full legalization hurdle? Uh, New Mexico is a hard blue state, a very progressive state, but once you get out of the urban areas of Las Cruces, Albuquerque, and Santa Fe, yeah. New Mexico is rural and conservative. And I think still the, uh, the stigma around uh, cannabis as an illicit substance is very much alive and well. Um, and also, you know, for several reasons, New Mexico is not a state that is one that is set up to get things done quickly. 
right? We have, uh, we're, we're the last state that has a volunteer legislature. If you look at like, you know, California, um, those are we're the last jobs. State. I didn't realize we were the last state that still has that set up. Yeah, we're, we're the last state with, with volunteer legislators and they meet 30 and 60 days alternating each year compared to yeah. California where it's like Congress, they're in session most of the year and they can just get a, a lot more done. Um, I think New Mexico, um, and I'm, I'm born and raised, I'm a generational New Mexican, and I think New Mexico uh, still very much suffers from this idea that we, we don't have the same ability to create our own reality as other states do, when actually, I, I, I would say that we have more of that ability. And I think this kind of scarcity mentality um, I think that, um, you know, the fact that we're a very poor state, I, I think there's a lot that holds us back from doing things that would be good for the state in a quick way. Um, but once we do it, that New Mexican ingenuity, uh, New Mexico wisdom is applied. And, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a way for us and there's a future for us to make up lost time in how we create and, and grow this industry quickly in New Mexico. That's a great answer. I love that. Now, let me let me build on something you just said. How, in terms of manifesting realities, how did you manifest your reality into the cannabis business in New Mexico? I did a little research on you before the call. You've got a super interesting background, including some, some time in China. How do you end up in the New Mexico cannabis business? Um, so I'm, I'm from New Mexico. My family and my mom's side moved here in the 40s. I'm a proud uh, product of public education. Um, I grew up in the mountains east of Albuquerque, uh, grew up in Tijeras, graduated from Manzano High School. From a very young age, I knew that I wanted to be a religion teacher. This is what I was obsessed with, like very young, like 12 years old. So when I graduated high school, I picked the university that I went to based on their religion department. Um, and then I came back for a few years and I, I bartended and I was in the service industry, um, which is you know where I started when I was... 15 years old, my first job was a dishwasher. And by 16, I was a line cook um, in this restaurant right. in the East Mountains. And um, then I went back and I, I did some graduate work at the University of Hawaii, also in religion. Uh, I taught religion for one semester at the university. And then, um, you know, that's still very much, there's some, some reality in where I kind of retire as a, as a religion teacher. I just love right. I love religion. I love the, you know, the myths of old and new. Um, and I love um, where, where some people would say that I'm not a religious person. I would say that to be human is to be religious. So it's just the most fascinating thing and still very much impacts how I see and move through the world. Um, I also I worked in the nonprofit sector for like 15 years. So yeah. I think those two things. And then the, you know, I... I I kind of got plucked away. My last nonprofit job, I was the state director for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And this was also where I kind of got some policy chops and started interacting with our, our legislature and became interested in state politics. Um, and then I was plucked away by a Seattle-based public affairs firm where I ran the New Mexico office of that for five years, working on all kinds of different important things in New Mexico, um, healthcare, education, um, all these different things that you know, like we were talking, New Mexico maybe doesn't get things done quickly. And I, I, I felt like I was part of the infrastructure to help progress in the state. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I struck out on my own and I launched my own public affairs firm and the cannabis chamber was one of my first clients. And the previous company I had given, um, I had given a proposal to, when I heard that they were talking about founding this chamber, I gave a proposal to help with the initial founding of it, you know, to set up and map out what the chamber was going to be. And they said, no, we're good. We've, we've got somebody else. And, you know, okay, cool. And then uh, a year and a half later, I came back with another proposal to run the cannabis chamber under a management contract with the staff I had at my public affairs firm. And they said, no, you know, we're cool. We have this uh, wonderful person, um, Vince who has a lot of DC experience from Chicago. And in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, DC experience, experience on the Hill doesn't necessarily translate to understanding how to work in New Mexico politics. But, uh, you know, Vince led this organization for the first year and did a really tremendous job laying the groundwork and laying the foundation that I was able to, to step in um, when he had some changes in his life and, and take over for him. And um, 
the, the rest is history. Here we are today with a, an organization that I think has a very vibrant membership. Um, uh, whereas the industry was kind of insular before and everybody was like very much protecting their own stuff. Now there's open lines of communication and it's very supportive. And yeah. uh, I feel like we're making good on the goal of diminishing that scarcity mentality in the cannabis industry in our state. All right, excellent. Now, sort of developing on some of the topics you were mentioning there, I can imagine based on your background that the social equity piece that is in HB 12, if we kind of fast forward into the current legislation, that I, I imagine that that social equity piece is, is pretty important to you. What are, your, what are some of your thoughts on that? It's been receiving some attention. The Republicans in the Senate said it shouldn't even be a part of this bill. It should be a completely separate bill. I think that was Cliff Pirtle in the judiciary. What, what's your take? Uh, super important, absolutely required. Also probably the single hardest thing to do the way that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So, and Representative Martinez mentioned this several times, the way that other states have legalized cannabis is via ballot referenda. So they take it directly to the voters and it's very simple ballot language, you know, legalized cannabis for people over 21 and registered voters like you and me can say yes or no. And then it's incumbent on the, on the legislature of those states to figure out how to do it. The way that our state is trying to do it, which is legislatively, has only happened twice and really only once. It's happened in Vermont and Illinois and Vermont's, Vermont's legislative language was you know, two pages long. So it was more like a, a ballot than it was anything else. So mm -hmm. the way that we're trying to do it um, creates a mechanism for us to incorporate a lot of the important social equity pieces, but it doesn't mean that it's the, the easiest way to do it. And that's why you know, we've worked for several years to figure out how to create this legislative vehicle to, to get it done. And, you know, I'll admit that from a chamber perspective, when we saw the bill fail um, last year, and when we saw uh, a certain chairman of a certain committee kind of eviscerate the bill for having a lot of fluffy language around social equity that in, in his mind didn't belong in the enabling legislation, the, the path of the chamber was, well, we just need to get a bill passed. We mm -hmm. just need to have a, a very simple uh, approach that creates a regulatory framework and a tax structure. And then we can work on all those things down the road. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad, part of me is glad that that's not what ended up being the, the final approach in HB 12. Part of me is glad that we did include those really important pieces. I think that those really important pieces are still very much a problem. I think the automatic expungement, again, 100% the right thing to do, absolutely what should happen. But I don't think there's a clean way to do it. Um, you know, yeah. there's several agencies, the, the district attorney, the attorney general, the administrative office of the courts, uh, um, Department of Public Safety. There are all these agencies that really need to come together and figure out how this can be done where it's not incumbent on people who have cannabis violations for them to do all the legwork to get them removed from their record. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, during the special session, you know, we do see like a, a breakout of the approaches of, um, you know, dealing with automatic expungement separately, um, uh, figuring out how to allocate funding um, in a way that can help to, you know, undo some of the harms from this war on drugs that everybody knows is racist. Everybody knows yeah. from the beginning has been a tool to systematically target black and brown people and has disproportionately to this day disproportionately affects people of color. And I, I think we absolutely right. have to do that. And it's absolutely the, the hardest part of this yeah. is figuring out how to do that. Listen, we couldn't agree with you more speaking on behalf of the, the folks I work with here at New Mexico Grass. We are totally in line with the concept. We think it's necessary. It's super important. Um, we want to see it. But you know, listening to Cliff Pirtle and others talk about it, and, and even you, it, it's, it is, you can make an argument that there maybe should be another piece of legislation. Maybe that would be easier to, to do all the things that need to be done, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a part of this bill. So I agree, it's complicated, though. If it's a part of the bill, we support it. If they took it out and tried to do it in a separate way, we would also support that effort. But our perspective is, especially from the micro side, we want legalized cannabis and that industry to exist. Particularly, we want the micro license. Yeah. And also, we want social justice, but I don't think those things necessarily have to come as a pair. 
I, I understand. Um, I understand the intention of coupling them, and it's to make sure yeah. that you don't lose one for the other. I but agree. I also think that um, I, I think that there's uh, a real danger. I, I think less so with the special session because we'll have this opportunity. If we talk more about the special session, we have this opportunity for a really focused discussion about it. And I, I'm not sure that the risk is there, but I, I will tell you that the biggest concern from an industry standpoint is putting this off for another year or another two years. If, if we have to wait for another 60 day session, by then we'll have legalized cannabis in Mexico, we'll have legalized cannabis in Texas, yeah. and we'll be one of the last states um, you know, to do it. And it's, it's really important for this that we, um, that we have a strong foundation for how New Mexico relates to cannabis from a business perspective, from a, a moral perspective, like how, how comfortable we are with cannabis before federal legalization happens, which yeah. is not gonna happen with the Biden administration. I would oh, hope you don't, that we would you have- You don't think so? No, Biden is pretty oh, clear in his campaign you, that he doesn't wanna legalize cannabis. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I do think that we'll see it descheduled. I think we'll have it removed as a schedule one drug and it won't be anywhere on the schedule. I think it'll be decriminalized. Um, the Moores Act, the Safe Banking Act, I think those will pass through the Senate this year. And I think the next uh, Democratic president, Kamala Harris, will probably legalize cannabis. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're putting it four plus years, but federal legalize, legalization is coming. Just not right yet. It's down the road. Yeah. Three, three plus years. Three plus years. All right. Yeah. yeah three plus years. Okay. Um, you mentioned the special session. Let's talk about that. What can, what can you tell us about it? What are you hearing? Um, any any news that you want to report or anything that, that what, what are your thoughts on the special session coming up? Sure. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people talking about the reason that we need to have a special session. And I think there's a lot of theories. And I think there's a lot of, frankly, negativity that uh, shame on the legislature for not getting it done during the 60 day session. Listen, this is I think it is absolutely the best move on behalf of the governor and behalf of Senate leadership to create this focus space. Because I totally agree. The, the truth is that we just ran out of time. I, if, um, if cannabis was pushed to the Senate floor, um, I'm confident that we would have debated it for hours and hours and it would have eventually passed. But yeah. there was a lot of good legislation that passed off the Senate floor the last 15 hours of the session. And I, I think it would have been unfair for all those, you know, important bills to not get um, their time because of of cannabis and you know some of the the grandstanding that would have happened on the Senate floor. So I, I think it's absolutely the best thing to do to take two days, um, get this thing across the finish line, and if we do it quickly, which sounds like it's still going to happen uh, next week, um, then the original timeline as it was in the House Bill 12, you know, the last version of House Bill 12, we can still stick to that timeline with new producers, uh, new micro licenses, and the existing medical cannabis producers in good standing, having an opportunity to, to get plants in the ground and ensuring that we have sufficient supply um, for the, the first, you know, when that trigger is pulled, then we have our first adult use sale. Right, right. Can you, do you know the, the, the the details of how the special session works. Do they introduce the HB 12 legislation with amendments that was the last bill we saw? Do they rewrite and start from scratch? Does it go through both chambers? How does the special session exactly work? I'm not sure, but right. here's I'm not what sure I, either. I didn't mean to put you on the bottom. No, the no, spot. that's okay. I, wasn't sure either. I mean, I, I have a, a sense of what I think will happen, but don't hold me to it. So okay. what, what I think will happen is uh, a piece of legislation that looks a lot like HB 12, but will benefit from a little bit more improvement. So, you know, mm -hmm. HB 12, um, there were, it, it went through several committees in the House, it was battle tested, it went through several committees in the Senate, and each of those stops, it received amendments that, that made it better. And I know that, uh, you know, one of the reasons they were expecting such a long conversation in the Senate is there were a bunch of floor amendments that um, maybe hadn't been seen before. So maybe some, yeah. some really novel ideas that would improve the bill. So what I would expect is to see something that looked a lot like House Bill 12 as it came out of Senate Judiciary, which was the last committee, but with some tweaks to, uh, to make it even better, you know, so we can avoid some of the conversation on the Senate and we can just make sure that we have 
the absolute best product uh, available. And then what I would expect is it to be introduced in both chambers. So you have mere versions or very close versions in the House and in the Senate, and they'll have to go to at least one committee. So there'll have to be at least one committee um, in each chamber. And I would expect it to go through the House really quickly, like it has the last two years, mm -hmm. um, and then to go to the Senate. And then I would expect six hours of debate on the Senate floor. I don't know. I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, more conversation on the Senate floor, but um, if this is the only thing or one of the only things that legislators are laser focused on for this special session, um, I think that we can get it done in two days. And just to reiterate, it was so close. Um, yeah. And I think it just needs a last nudge and we'll get there. So what do you think the odds are that we have cannabis legalization at the end of the special session? The odds, like a percentage? Yeah, like is it a hundred percent in your mind, the sure bet, or you know, are there some? Are you? Are, do you have any concerns about it? Yeah, it's between eighty-eight and a hundred percent. All right, in there. fair enough. I'm, I'm very confident that it's going to happen. Um, okay. I, I think that the you know the will of the legislature to push it through all these different committees and to pass it out of the house. I think the will of the legislature is there. I think the last round of polling had. Uh, New Mexicans, more than 75% of New Mexicans supporting it. Yeah. I, I think the, the will is there. Um, and I think there's an urgency that hasn't existed before with everyday New Mexicans like you and me, as well as legislators, as well as the governor. Excellent. Excellent. Ben, is there anything you'd like to leave our viewers with? Any message from the chamber or any thoughts on the process you'd like to leave our legislators as they move into this special session? Um, I, you know, I would just say this is an exciting thing for the entire state. I, I know that, um, you know, if you're in the industry, if you're looking to get into the industry, you're probably watching this more closely. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a really important thing for the state of New Mexico. Um, this is a really important thing for our country. And um, man, what a time to be alive. I'm, I'm just really excited about this. And I'm really excited for the future. And I'm, I'm excited to, to help define uh, through the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, what the, the lane is for the industry to be a, a really good player in the state and to, you know, help all these other businesses enter and, and be successful in this exciting new industry. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped. That's awesome. We're very pumped as well. We absolutely share your enthusiasm. We're sitting on the sidelines with our fingers crossed. We kind of approach it from the micro business license, but we completely agree with your entire sentiments there. Ben Lewinger from the New Mexico Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you and hearing your views on cannabis in New Mexico. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it.